It was two weeks ago that I came to church earlier than normal, and I shared this story with you last week and found a bunch of the members in the kitchen preparing food. And one of them hadn't shaved and said, oh, pastor, please forgive me. They'd woken up very early to prepare a meal for family promise. And I was dressed in my suit a little by way of comparison and contrast to those who may have gotten up at 0500 to be here. And I said, you look like angels to me. And I have to say that I didn't see angels today, but I think I heard them in the sound of the choir and in the sound of the special music this morning. I can't wait to be with Jesus and hear that heavenly, heavenly choir. How about you, friends? It's good to come into the house of the Lord to worship together, to open our hearts to His Spirit, to be fed through the music, through the giving, and through the spoken word. Our message today is taken from John chapter 1. And I must set the context with you. Uh, we started last week in John chapter 1. John chapter 1 starts, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, as almost a direct parallel to the Genesis story. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And the Spirit moved upon that darkness and created light. So out of darkness, the Holy Spirit drew forth light. I like that illustration. I don't know if you fully embrace it. In different times in my life, I find myself not willingly in a dark place, but in a dark place sometimes of circumstance in a dark place sometimes of my own causing, in a dark place where I don't know exactly how to get out. And sometimes I try to gather in all that darkness and stick it in a box. And that's insurmountable, because the only way to dispel darkness is that light must be cast. And it is by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit that that happens. So it's against that context that we move into John chapter 1, and we find there that God is calling a man. In verse 6 of John chapter 1, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And I'd like to suggest to you today that that calling, that sending from God made all of the difference. Because you could change that verse very easily to say that there was a person sent from God and their name was Mary, Luke, Andrew, Matthew, Martha, or your name in that verse. There was a person sent from God whose name was and place your name there. Because God has a purpose for you today. He wants to send you into the world to be the light that prepares the world for His coming. Do you believe that, friends? You're not here by accident this morning. You're here by God's calling, God's design for your life, to hear the purpose that God has for you, not sometime in the distant future, not sometime in the distant months, but this week, this day, this hour. If you will respond, He will send you into the world to proclaim the nearness of His second coming. This daily sending, this daily serving is what he has called us to be about. Not called to be the light of the world, 
but called to give witness and testimony to the light of the world. John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 9, uh, verse 8. He was not the light of the world, but was sent to bear witness of that light, being John. That was the true light which lights every man that came into the world. He was in the world that the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So, too, we are to bring the witness and testimony to each person we come in contact with each and every day to reach them for the gospel's sake. Verse 12 says, And as many as received him, to them gave he power to become, what does your Bible say? Children the children of God. And in the old King James, it says the sons of God. And lest you be literalists, the sons and daughters of God even so to them that believe on his name. Probably one of the most powerful scriptures uh, in scripture is that as we receive him, he gives us power to become his sons and his daughters. He changes our relationship with him. He draws us into his family. He draws us into a relationship with him as he being our heavenly father, pouring out his love, his goodness, his grace into our lives. It's an amazing story, isn't it, friends? Does it cause you at times just to reflect on it day by day and through the week to say, God, what amazing grace, what incredible love that you have for me. My life is so full, I must tell somebody of your goodness and grace. For you find that's exactly what John did. It is that calling, that sending of John that made all of the difference. Have you sensed that God has called you? Have you sensed the sending that want, God wants to do through you? Because it is that sending that God call somebody into your life before you knew him to make contact with you. Do you remember that first time you were invited to accept Christ as your Savior? Do you remember that first contact that you had? You may have grown up in a Christian home where Christianity is just part of your life. There are those here today, though, that did not have that experience and can call forth that experience of somebody offering the invitation to open their hearts and lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, offering the first prayer that they experienced. And friends, he doesn't leave it for somebody else to do. He's calling me. He's calling you. He wants to send not the person next to you. He wants to send you you into the world. Do you believe that, friends? Now, let me be perfectly clear, if I haven't been already. It is that sending that is an empowerment. It is that sending and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will fill you and will guide your words, your thoughts, as you reach out to those on the job, as you have interactions with your neighbor, as you have actions with your sons and your daughters, your aunts and your uncles, your grandparents, your children, that they might be drawn into a closer relationship with God. Now let's look just for a moment in the middle of John chapter 1. John bear witness of him in verse 15 and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spoke, that he comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And verse 16 proclaims, And of his fullness all have what? All have received, and grace for grace. Oh, we don't normally use that expression, grace for grace. But what the scripture writer is trying to express here, it's just not grace. It's not just grace added to grace. It's grace squared. It's grace exponentially. It's God's goodness, his fullness poured out upon you. So much so that the 
uh, that John, the author, as he penned these words, he could not find a greater expression except to say that God's grace is poured out to you in a magnitude that you can't even begin to express. Do you ever find that to be the case in your life, friends? Do you ever find that to be the case? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you ever find that to be the case, friends? Ever? Do you ever find, as you're worshiping the Lord in the quietness of your study at home, in the quietness at work, that you just want to say, Lord, I don't know what to do. You're so good. You're so gracious. Through this difficult time in my life, I see you working. Your spirit has been comforting me. I don't know where you are. I'm in darkness, Lord. But send that light. Draw me out of that darkness. I don't know how you're going to do it, whether it's through the spoken word on Sabbath, through the word, through somebody coming into my life. But Lord, I need your Holy Spirit to lift me up. And when you realize that he's done that, it's grace poured out upon grace. Can you say amen? amen. It is that type of experience that will cause the church to rise up and proclaim the goodness of God in ways that others around him will be able to see it, much like John the Baptist did in proclaiming the nearness and the coming of Christ, who was about to come on scene. He was preparing the way. And I believe, friends, that as Christians today, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are called to be prepared, but more than we be prepared, we are called to prepare a people to receive the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? It's not up to your neighbor sitting next to you. It's not up to your husband, your wife, the preacher, the conference, the church. It's up to you as a believer in Christ to reflect on the goodness of Christ and say, Lord, help me share. If I don't have much to share, Lord, let me get the magnifying glass out of your Holy Spirit and let me recall the way that you have blessed me and give these humble lips at least a few words that I can share with others that they will find the joy that I find in relishing in your goodness, because there is a multitude of people that are languishing for the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can see it in their faces, can't you? You can see it in their hopelessness. You can see it in their talk and their conversation. Where is this world heading? Listen to the debates that are going on in whatever it is that we're going on in now, in, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, elections, and uh, I won't go to meddling there. You can see it in the world affairs. You can find it in people's per personal lives. For this law was given, verse 17 says, for this law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by whom? Jesus Christ. What a magnificent thing. Grace and truth, the balance that brings balance to the Christian life. Grace and truth walking in the goodness and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ draws us into the truth that we cannot save ourselves, draws us into a life of obedience, draws us into a life of service, draws us into being sent by Him. What an amazing picture. A man sent by God. That made all of the difference, friends. So, against that background, we go to a second thought in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, Jesus, uh, John sees Jesus coming on to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I have said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bear record of the coming of Jesus in a faithful way. And it is against that that, the, that Jesus calls his disciples out. In John chapter 1, verse 43, pardon me, John chapter 1, verse 39, uh, 37. As Jesus walked, um, as John was walking 
and looking on Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Verse 37, they followed Jesus. It's amazing to me that the term follow Jesus and come and see are linked in this last half of John chapter 1. So as we look at John chapter 1, verse 20, um, just a moment, please. As we look at John chapter 1, verse 30, uh, 43, the day following Jesus would go into Galilee, and he finds Philip, and he says unto Philip, what? Follow me. You know, I like the complexity of God's great love for us, but I also like sometimes simple things. You know, I... I, I appreciate deep theological studies and the nuances of Greek and Hebrew. I've got, I, I appreciate all of that. But in my mail wiring sometimes, my wife doesn't give me a lot of words. She just gives me a few and I get it. If, she, if words don't work, it's the look that works. <laughs> Some of you got that. Others, it'll be Tuesday. Um, but in, in this passage, the words are so simple, but the simple words are filled with so much saliency and kind of nuancing. That day following Jesus would go forth from Galilee and find Philip, and he said, follow me. And in verse 48, Nathanael said unto him, can any good come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, what? Come and see. And again, the next day, um, excuse me, uh, come and see and follow me. So the command was simple. Follow me, follow behind me, and I will take you to where I am going and come and see for yourself what I am doing, which is really an introduction to the signs and miracles that Jesus will be doing in John chapter 2 and John chapter 3 and through the Gospel of John. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Just a couple of uh, texts in John. John chapter 8, verse 12. You can jot the reference down and look it up. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. Following Christ means walking in the light that he gives to you, turning away from the darkness. Following Christ means listening to his voice. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, for I know them, and they follow me. So it's walking in the light, listening to the voice. Isn't it amazing sometimes? You'll pick up the phone, and the voice on the other end you'll recognize just like that. It might be a friend from five years ago that hadn't called for five years. It might be a neighbor. It might be an aunt, an uncle. But immediately you recognize that voice. When you are communicating with God on a daily basis, and when Jesus is your good shepherd, when you're in his word, walking in his life, you'll listen and you'll hear that still small voice. Do you believe that, friends? It's a comforting voice that says, cast all your cares upon me. Walk with me. I have a plan for your life. Follow me. I learned a life's lesson, uh, a simple life's lesson a number of years ago that I'll share with you that I believe illustrates appropriately so what it means to follow. When we look at John chapter 1, we can see the sending, we can see the work of the Holy Spirit, we can see the contrast and comparison of walking in darkness, walking in light. We can see that God is calling us to follow him and what? I lost you. Follow me and come and see. So the purpose is to follow Christ to see what he will do in your life. It was Monday afternoon quite some time ago, when the phone rang, and on the other end of the phone, it was a distant relative that I will name 
Andy. I will uh, protect the identity of the distant relative. He had traveled into town and said, I'd like to tour the state of Colorado. Oh, wonderful. When are you coming in? Can I use your car? Sure. We had an extra car. So he took off. This was um, B.C., before cell phones. <laughs> Some of you got that. So he took off on, uh, let's see, it was Tuesday, and he came back on Monday. And I came home in the afternoon and said, uh, Hi, this is Andy. I just want to let you know your car is in Denver. And I got a ride with a chaplain, and I'll be up there in about an hour. Now, it's an hour's drive, plus or minus. And I thought, okay, car's in Denver. He's coming. No way to reach him. I guess I'll stay put. I looked at my schedule, and I said, well, this is really <laughs> inconvenient. And uh, the only time that I have to go down there is immediately. I packed up a few tools in uh, one of my vehicles, and I said, when he gets here, Guess where we're going? You got it, to Denver. So he came. I said, guess what? My car's in Denver, and I need it back here. I can't drive two cars. So we're going to Denver to pick it up. And I thought, what do I need? I threw some tools and a chain and some other stuff. I thought, it's a long tow, but we'll get, we'll get somewhere somehow. Uh, we pulled down, sure enough. There parked right next to the church in Denver was my car. And I said, I think I'm going to try the obvious. I just wonder. I had taken a gas can with me. I poured the gas in the car. Figured if there's gas in it, it won't hurt. We'll use it at some point in time. Got in the car, turned the key, and it started right up. I said, well, this is a good sign as I muttered under my breath, <laughs> only, only to myself. I said, here's the plan. It's good news. We don't have to tear the car apart, tow it anywhere. It's running. And knowing, uh, knowing it was going to be so easy, as we pulled out of the parking lot, knowing that he didn't know the way very well, I said, I just ask one thing. Follow me. It was dark by then, about 9 o'clock at night, and we started out up I-25. And wouldn't you know it, about five miles north of Denver, a police car pulled in behind me. No light shining or anything. Now, Andy was behind me, but he got tired of driving slow. So he pulled out around me, and he thought he'd show me the way. Now, there weren't any turns um, between where we were and the exit. So I said, this is pretty easy going. Even if he drives, I'll find him eventually. I sped up as fast as I thought I'd dare, uh, and he continually pulled away. Uh, well, you know, he'll find his way. It's only one turn, and if he gets lost, he'll get there eventually. About three miles up the road, I heard this, the police officer went around me. I heard this kind of grinding sound coming from the right wheel of my vehicle. And I thought, oh no, it sounds like a wheel bearing. Now, where's Andy? I'm thinking, hmm, I better pull over and check this out. I pulled over in the darkness of that night and got out of the car and went around to the passenger side. It was a van that I had, and I looked, and there was no tire, no wheel. It was gone. And I go, hmm, this might be more of a problem than what I'm thinking right now. I peered off in the darkness. Speaking of being in darkness, it was dark. Couldn't see my watch. Looked down the hill. And I saw something down there, and I thought, maybe, maybe that's a wheel. It was probably 150 feet downhill. So I hiked downhill, no moonlight, just hiked down there. Sure enough, there it was, a tire. It was smiling at me. 
I rolled it up the hill, and I said, well, this is good. When Andy comes, surely he'll come, because I won't be getting home. He'll turn around. He'll have enough brains to come back and look for me. And uh, I put the tire against the side, ran the flashers, and said, well, I better get about trying to figure this out. About three minutes later, another policeman came by, and he said, are you having any problems, sir? I said, well, I can't really afford a $200 tow. I said, no, I think, I think I'll be fine. I said, if I'm here a little later on your second sweep, please stop. He took off. That was mistake number one on my part. I proceeded to figure out if I took a lug nut out of the rear tire or two, I might be able to put it in the front. And I actually got that accomplished. Had the tire on. Now, mind you, in between times, I was running the battery uh, periodically to keep the flashers going. Until I had the tire on, I got in, and I hit the key, and it went click, click, click. Now, it's about quarter after 12 now in the darkness. And I'm going, nope, where is that police officer? I think he's probably at home in bed. Where is Andy? Well, wherever he is... I'm thinking, I can't call him, and I'm going, it's a long walk. I looked back, and I looked at Denver, and I counted. A car went by the other way. I counted 1,001, 1,002, and I figured it was about 11 miles. I couldn't see my watch. 11 miles that way, or in the darkness the other way, I don't know, 15, 20 miles. And I wasn't going anywhere, now in total darkness. Hmm... I went out and started walking down the highway, and fortunately, there was a highway uh, maintenance crew. This big dump truck picks me up, says, would you like a ride, sir? Sure would. Well, there's a phone probably up. I knew there wasn't any phone going that way. He said, well, I'll take you back to a phone back towards Denver. So we spent 35 minutes, dropped me off at a gas station, and I said to myself, boy, I just hope Andy has the phone turned on in his bedroom when he got back to my house and doesn't let it go to the answering machine. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Andy. Oh, yeah, Andy. Um, yeah, I know you've been waiting for me to get there. Uh, I'm, I'm back in Denver. I need you to come back, get off on exit 14, and I'm at the go-go shop. Uh, the gas station just off the exit. You think you can do that? Now, what exit is that? You sure? Okay. You're on your way? Okay. Somewhere after 2.30 a.m., I see the white car pull into the gas station. Sure enough, it's Andy. Now, by this time, I'm more than a little upset. I'm not exactly sure what I want to say to him. I knew I probably shouldn't say much. The only words that came out of my mouth were, what part of follow me don't you understand? It's not difficult to understand when Jesus asks us to follow him. It is for our own benefit. May the Lord bless us as we do so. Our closing hymn is hymn number 623. Father, your people have proclaimed that they will follow. Father, lead. Lead us this week. Lead us in opportunities to share your magnificent grace. Lead us in pathways of service. Lead us into your presence. Fill our hearts with your spirit. Oh, Father, we will follow as you lead. Amen.